Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for December 10th, 2023. This is the second week in Advent. This is called Peace Sunday. So I'll start by reading a scripture from uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 40, which is very famous to read around the holiday times. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight the desert in in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. And uneven ground shall be made level, and the rough places made plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear, says the cities of Judah. Here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. Our second reading is from 2 Peter. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day shall be like a thousand years, and a thousand years shall be like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but it is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, And the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. And then finally, our um, gospel reading is from the beginning of Mark. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written by the prophet Isaiah, See that I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole of Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem were going out to meet him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan and confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The most well-known line from today's 2 Peter reading is, With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. Peter is saying to be patient. God's promise will be fulfilled in the fullness of time. Now, it seems that impatience has a very long history, doesn't it? Even 2,000 years ago, the early Christians were impatient for Jesus' return. So, the author of Peter Peter's letter gives us words of comfort. The Lord is patient. The Lord wants all to come to repentance. This truth can be applied to the authors of Isaiah as well. Between chapters 39 and 40, there is a gap of over 160 years. 
We know this because Isaiah talks to King Hezekiah around 690 BC uh, in verse in in the present tense in chapter 39. Then he talks about the freedom of the Judeans from exile around 530 BC from the chapter 40 onwards. Talk about patience. Talk about one day being like a thousand years to the Lord. The stretches of time in our biblical narrative are immense. And it's odd how Christians seem to compress time without appreciating how different things were in various parts of the Bible. For the different parts of Isaiah, it's like switching the story from the Civil War to today in an instant, while ignoring all of the generations of history in between. The highly regarded Isaiah scholar, Walter Brueggemann, calls the book of Isaiah a mighty oratorio whereby Israel sings its story of faith. He calls it a magnificent artistic achievement that tells in the broad sweep of history how the people navigated in the midst of a demanding sequence of imperial powers. This small nation, Israel, was constantly buffeted by the superpowers of Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Surrounded by enemies and after centuries of warfare, there comes a glimmer of hope. The hope for peace. In this hope, they heard, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And then a voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Last week was Hope Sunday. In the darkness and in the midst of sin and degradation, there was a small glimmer of hope. On that first week of Advent, the promise of Jesus seemed distant. This week is Peace Sunday, and that glimmer of hope has blossomed into a cry in the wilderness. The cry is for comfort and peace, and it still seems far away in the vast sweep of time, but it is real. And the cry is becoming louder and louder as we come closer to the day when the Anointed One will come on Christmas. We are introduced to John the Baptizer in the opening sentences of Mark's Gospel. It seems odd, doesn't it? Where is the Christmas story? What about the 30 plus years of Jesus' life that came before this scene? It starts with the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Before this passage, Jesus was already born and had already lived a life of an ordinary man. By first century standards, he had already lived a big portion of his life. He was no spring chicken. He had standing. He was mature. He spoke with the authority of a rabbi. The way had been prepared for Jesus to come to bring good news, to bring the gospel to the people. So what is this good what is this good this good news through the centuries of church history and with all the fighting and all the craziness of life it's easy to be confused but these verses bring us back to the simple story of grace the paths have been made straight the rough places have been made plain Jesus is the hope of that all the complications of life life can be set straight by Jesus' message of redemption and love, that Jesus will feed his flock like a shepherd, that he will gather the lambs in his arms. This is a vision of comfort. But bringing good news invites opposition. When we hear John cry out, we think of a street corner preacher crying, Repent! while promising judgment, fire, and brimstone. That doesn't sound very comforting, does it? If this makes you feel fearful of the gospel, then you have missed the point of the gospel. When you are gentle and kind, providing comfort to people, you will be accused of giving aid to sinners. You will be accused of excusing their sin. 
When you give comfort to broken people, to the poor, to the addicted, to the sex workers, to people on the streets, to the shunned and the hated, then you will be seen as unclean. The religious leaders of Jesus' time said that about Jesus. They said he was a compromiser. They said he was impure. They said he was leading people into unrighteousness. Always think about what Jesus would do in every situation. Would Jesus take the side of the powerful and the judgmental? Would he condemn people who were in need of help? Would he cry sinner and repent at the hurting and the vulnerable? He only ever shamed the powerful. He only ever condemned the judgmental people who tried to entrap him. Jesus always put people above the rules and above doctrine. The good news is that he showed that the law was for people and not people for the law. If you ever doubt whether you are condoning bad behavior or excusing someone's sin, ask yourself what would Jesus do? Many times you will be surprised by the answer, being supportive and kind rather than judgmental. Because the gospel turns everything on its head. In the midst of darkness, there is light. In the midst of hopelessness, there is hope. In the midst of warfare, there is peace. In the coming two weeks, we will have Joy Sunday and Love Sunday. As we wait for Christmas Day, we will, say, we will see how the gospel brings joy in the midst of despair, how it brings love in the midst of hate. As we see in these scriptures, the story of God with us is a very long one. Hundreds of years in Isaiah. One day as a thousand years in Peter's letter a full life of work and anonymity in Jesus before he brought the good news to the humanity. So be patient. Your best years are ahead of you because you have time to be bold in spreading kindness and comfort without regard to the rules or your reputation. Be like Jesus. Spread the good news of his coming. Let us pray. Loving and incarnate God, you promised good news to your people. We grow impatient. We judge sinners. We give into disdain and despair. But you have different ideas. Jesus is coming. He is coming to redeem all humanity. So instead of worrying about today, help us to take the long view so that we can see the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Fulfill the promise of the coming of Jesus in us. In his holy name we pray. Amen.